Last week, Pastor Dwayne said that uh, finding a scripture uh, and the choices that were in the lectionary was like looking for a polar bear in a snowstorm. I couldn't find anything. <laughs> but based on with scriptures that he had last, I came across this one, and I thought, yes, this is the one that works for this Sunday, this Sunday. Why? Well, in case you don't know and you haven't read your bulletin, we're going to be having love feast, a full love feast after service. And that involves the cup and the bread and the basin. And everyone goes, basin, yeah, the basin. Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. He is He's on again a beeline to Jerusalem. And he has talked to his disciples before. He says, now listen, I'm going to tell you what's going on. And he laid it all out for them. And it's like someone mentioned to me this morning, people sometimes just don't listen. They just don't hear. Well, we all know that. And if you remember the Snoopy cartoon, when they have it and the adults are going, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's sometimes how it happens in our brain. We just, uh, blah, blah, blah. We don't catch it. We don't listen. We don't understand. We don't. We can't connect it to anything, and it's so outrageous that we, we just don't pay any attention to it. So as Jesus is going along, he decides, maybe I should tell my disciples what's going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He says, I'm going to be taken up by the scribes and the high priests. This is, this is the scripture right before this one. Uh, I am going to be mocked. I'm going to be spit upon. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be condemned to death. And I will be killed. And in three days, I shall rise again. That is the scripture right before this. Jesus has laid out what is going to happen to him. Now we have James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And they said, we would like you to give us something. We would like you to agree to something. And he says, well, what do you want? What do you want? Well, we would like to sit on your right and left hand when you're in glory. Excuse me, did you miss the part with the flogging, the crucifixion? Did we miss that, the death? All they heard was, he's going to rise in three days, and that's and he'll go to glory, and he'll be in glory, and that's we're going to see. They were, they had their Jesus had his eyesight on Jerusalem, and he knew exactly what was going to happen. He has trying to get his disciples to understand, but what they're seeing is we're going to power. And sometimes people, and sometimes certain churches, they espouse this concept of, oh, you're going to have power. Hmm. And that's what his disciples were asking. And, and Jesus looks at him and he says, can you drink of this cup? Now, what is this cup? If you remember Jesus at Gethsemane, the, the night he was taken by those scribes and the high priests, He's praying to God and he's saying, Lord, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. What is this cup? Capture, flogging, humiliation, and death. That was his cup. That is what was waiting for him. As Christians, living in this country, living under how we live and under our constitution and however else in our culture or whatever you want to say, we do not have that fear that just because we say, I'm a Christian, someone's going to shoot us. But that happens in other countries. And that's happening now in other countries. And that's when it comes to the point, are you willing to claim being a Christian? Are you willing to drink of the cup? Now, you will might face some scorn, laughter, when they say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Well, I, 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 
I don't think that's right. Let's go egg that house in your younger days. <laughs> let's go egg that house or let's toilet paper that house or something like that. And you say, no, I don't think that's very nice. And your friends may laugh at you and they make fun of you. And sometimes as adults, you are urged to do something which is eh, a little shady, a little shady, maybe not now, you know. Sometimes, yeah. And you say, no, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. Being a Christian is not easy and never think it is. Because what you are called to do is to put yourself on a path that says yes is yes and no is no and you follow the Ten Commandments and you follow the two commandments that Jesus said supersedes all the Ten Commandments. And friends, that's not easy. <laughs> We're human. We all fall. We all stumble. We all have those moments of complete frustration where we just can't stand it anymore and we lose it a little bit. I was talking to a lady who was very concerned. She said, somebody was coming to visit and she really couldn't stand them. I said, hey, you gotta learn how to float. You gotta learn how to float. You know, you can't let things get you to the point where you're sinking in frustration and anger. You gotta learn how to buoy yourself up with peace. How do you do that? Jesus, when he left his disciples, says, I leave my peace with you, a peace the world cannot understand. Being a Christian does not mean that you're going to make a fortune. It does not mean you're going to come into power. It doesn't mean any of that stuff. But it means that you will have the greatest gift that you can ever have, and that's the gift of peace. And that peace grows out of the fact that you know that you are a child of God and you're loved by God and God is watching over you and he is your rock. It doesn't matter how high the water comes. It doesn't matter how hard the wind blows. The Lord is your rock and that keeps you stationary and stable and calm. Because I'll tell you something, when you let your emotions overrun everything, when you let yourself just let go, it's never good. Sometimes you say words. You can't unsay them. They will always be there. Sometimes you may do actions that you can't undo. You must learn. When you get in those situations, start praying, folks. Start praying. And the Lord will give you that peace, and he'll send it into your heart, and he'll calm you down. I read an article that said, hey, when you get in one of those screaming, do you ever get in a screaming match with someone? <laughs> your children, your spouse, your friend, your friends, strangers, you know. It said, instead of replying immediately, chill, just chill. That little bit, let your brain readjust. Just a little bit. Readjust. That's what you got to do. Readjust. And you will find peace. You break that cycle of anger. When you can break that cycle of anger and frustration, then you can come into reconciliation and you can come into peace. Can you drink this cup? Can you have the baptism that I will have? The baptism, the baptism, the baptism was crucifixion. It was his flesh broken. It was a spear placed in his side. It was nails in his hands and his feet. It was a thorn, a thorn crown thrust upon his head. The blood poured out of his body baptism. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We do not 
We baptize with water. We baptize with water to cleanse the outer body. But we ask for the Spirit to enter into us internally and help us to cleanse, cleanse our thoughts, cleanse our actions, our moods. We are going to be doing <coughs> Love Feast. And the Love Feast is a couple parts. And I will tell you that in the old days, <laughs> it took a week. Uh, took a week to get the Love Feast. Took a week of preparation, preparing yourselves to go to Love Feast. And if you go to Ogwick Church of the Brother, and I was down there once, and they said, you know, when we went upstairs, we found all these cots. Well, people would come from all around when you're going to have a love feast, and they would join in. From community, other churches, they would come in, and they would have this fellowship all week in preparation for love feast. And I've told you before, love feast wasn't a standard thing. The church had to be in harmony. And I said, there was a special place. I'm not centering you out in the back row, okay? But that's where the people sat who had a problem with someone else in the congregation. <laughs> and until that place was empty, there would be no love feast because the love feast is the fellowship and the harmony within the church. And I once asked a lady, I said, why don't you come to Love Feast? Well, so-and-so, I don't agree with what he did, and I, I hold it against him. And I'm going, yeah, but that was a couple years ago. <laughs> Let it go. Get on with it. He's a brother in the church. We have to, you know how it is with family. Sometimes you have to give people leeway. They all have their peculiarities. And if we were all the same, it would be really boring. Remember that one. Remember that one. Oh, remember that one a lot. <laughs> but that's the truth. We are going to be having feet washing. Now, the scripture right after this one, Jesus talks about in society, the mighty, the rulers, they like to rule it over people. They like to tell you what to do. He says, but I do not call you to that. I call you to servanthood. And you remember when Jesus knelt to wash his disciples' feet, they said, no, no, no. You can't do that. You're our teacher. You're, you're, you're you know, you can't do that. And he says, I have. Why do, we have love, why do we have feet washing? Remember that little interchange he had with Peter? When Peter said, oh, don't wash my feet, wash all of me. Because he said, first of all, he said, don't wash me. He said, oh, yeah, I have to wash you. Well, wash all of me. No. If you've been cleansed once, I only need to wash your feet. And you know something, that's about the truth. Because in the life, if you take a bath and you start walking around, what's going to get dirty? The feet. Well, we have shoes now, I know. But in those days, they had sandals, and they would collect dirt like anything. You know, you're going, and the roads weren't paved. They didn't have PennDOT, you know, so they just had these dirt roads and cobble robes, and you know everything else that the animals let out, and it dries up, and it turns into dust. It was filthy, man. It was filthy. So the feet got dirty. And Jesus says, I wash your feet. I cleansed. I cleansed you. For Christians who have been baptized, the washing of feet is just a renewal, a remembrance of that baptism. But as we wash each other's feet, we also remember we are called to be a servant to each other, to serve each other. Do not ever put yourself above another. Don't do that. It said, the greatest of you must be the least of you, must be a slave to all. If you want to be first, got to be last. This complete servant 
output is what we are called to. And this is a reminder. What is love feast? It's to remember. Remember. You know, we have... I'm wearing a prayer covering. I haven't worn a prayer covering in this church. I've worn it in a lot of other churches. When I was doing pulpit supply, I would go and I would ask, okay, do they want me, if I'm going to be in the pulpit, do I have to have a prayer covering? And I'll be honest with you, usually it was yes. Yes. Now, I may have been in some conservative churches, too. I will agree to that. But when I was very, very young, I can remember my grandmother. She wore one of these every day of her life. And I think she was buried in one. Uh, by the time I was growing up, when I finally was baptized and went to uh, Love Feast, it was a requirement to participate in Love Feast to have a prayer covering for a woman. You didn't get one. A deaconess found you at the door and gave you one. <laughs> Here's your prayer covering. Times have changed. Times have changed. But I wear it today to commemorate my mother, my grandmother, and all those other women who sat in that church and wore their prayer coverings. What does it mean? I was at the home one time. I was asked to do a service. And I, my, my sir, it was, the message was concerning, hey, outward signs don't mean anything. So I had a big cross on, and I put my prayer covering on, and I was, you know, greeting the, the ladies, <laughs> the older ladies, <laughs> really old ladies, you know. And as my husband said, you know, you're old too. I said, yeah, but I'm not that old yet, you know. And I was looking at her, and I was saying, how are you? And she says, what church do you go to? I said, well, I, I go to the Church of the Brethren. She says, I knew that. I knew that by your prayer covering. Think about it. Think about how people can identify you, and they have an expectation of your actions, of who you are, of your character, based, based on what you wear. It shamed me. It shamed me. And I said, thank you. But I wear it today to remember. Why? Because what we are going to be doing to after service is a remembrance because we, we have to remember. We have to remember who and what we are, and what was the price paid. And like those disciples, we got to ask ourselves, are you willing to drink of that cup? Are you willing to change your life 360 degrees? Not to be in this culture, not to be in this world, but be in fellowship with each other in the church and in the greater church, and call yourself a Christian a follower of Christ. We come to service. We come on church Sunday mornings to listen to the scriptures, to hear them expounded, to give us insight on how we should be living our lives or what we should be doing or not doing. But this service afterwards, this full love feast which you are going to be engaged in, that is something totally different. That is for you. That is for you. Putting you in fellowship in this church, renewing, renewing your baptismal vows through the feet washing, through serving others, sitting down in a fellowship meal together. In the Hebrew culture, to sit down in a meal was to mean that you were at peace with each other. 
And in case, and I'll get this name right, Amalek. Amalek, Amalek. He wanted to make a treaty with Isaac. And they came to make this treaty. It's out of Genesis. And to seal the treaty, they ate together. By eating together, it sealed the covenant, the treaty that they had made with each other. The same happened with the Gibbonites. That was when, uh, it's out of the book of Joshua, uh, they were sort of trying to clear the land, you know, the promised land. And anybody was like living there, they were sort of clearing them out. And uh, the Gibbonites, they were sort of local people. But they got smart and they said, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to get our oldest clothes. We're going to get our most decrepit animal. We're going to get these worn out wine bottles and we're going we're to throw dust all over ourselves and we're going to look really, really tired and oh, dirty and hi, we're from far, far away. We've come to make a treaty with you. And they looked at him and they said, it looked like they came from far, far away. And the scripture says, they neglected to check with God. And what they did was they sat down and had a meal together. And by the time they figured out who they were and where they were from, it was too late because they had entered into a covenant of peace with them. See, that's what eating together is. It's a fellowship, but it's a covenant we make with each other, sharing food with each other. The other thing I found out was out of a uh, book. It said there was a Hebrew custom that if I, you know, nowadays, if you, if you want to uh, ask somebody to marry you, you get down on one knee. No, that's not how they did it. Uh, they would get a cup. They would put some wine in it. The man, you know, the man would put some wine in it, and he'd offer it to his lady friend. If she chose to drink out of it, they were betrothed. And then he would drink out of it. They were betrothed. That was a covenant. A covenant is an agreement. A covenant is where you put up something, they put up something, and you make an agreement. Yeah, that was a betrothal. We are going to take of the cup. We are going to eat of the bread. And we must do these things so we can remember who we are and what was sacrificed for us.